The title of our session today is uh, The Role of Technology in Sustainable Growth. And that title uh, made me think about what role technology played over the span of, of my very own banking career. I started out with an apprenticeship at Deutsche Bank in my hometown in, in Germany in 1987. Um, back then we had printed sheets with interest tables uh, on them to, to calculate compounded interest. We had these very bulky table calculators with little paper rolls on them where you would, you would key in large, uh, uh, long lines of numbers and if you keyed in one wrong number you had to start um, all over again um, if you were a bit of a geek uh, you had uh, maybe a texas instrument calculator which uh, which was able to do some some very simple formulas only very few and very important uh, people had mobile phones and these phones were as large and as heavy as as, uh, as a brick uh, we had no email, uh, we had telex machines, and um, social media wasn't, wasn't even a word yet. So to many of you, that, that may sound like ancient history. And if you think about where technology has taken us over the span of these 34 years, it's not just a different world, it feels like, feels like a different planet. The question, of course, is where will it take us from here? How will technology continue to sustain growth? Um, now, I'm not the best person to answer this question uh, in terms of technology. I'm really more of a, a passive follower, user of applications which were developed by, by much smarter people. Lucky for me, and lucky for you in the audience, the ABA today has assembled a panel of real experts on the topic, and they will give us their views on where the journey is going. Um, I will introduce each uh, panelist, each speaker as we go. We will first have three presentations that will be followed uh, by a panel discussion, which will blend into, uh, into the Q&A. As Teresa said, if you have questions, please type them into the questions box and we will uh, try to answer as, as, as many as, as possible in, in the time permitting. The total time for this session today is scheduled to be 90 minutes. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's start with the, um, with the first uh, presentation. Uh, it will be given to you by Ruchin Goyal. Ruchin is a senior partner in the financial institutions practice India and South Asia of Boston Consulting Group. And he will give us a glimpse of the banking journey of the future. Ruchin, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Oliver. I'll just share my screen. Hope my screen is visible. Yes. So as Oliver, you know, just described, uh, banks have come a very long way over the last many decades in terms of use of technology. Uh, but I would say, you know, we've just scratched the tip of the iceberg and there is a lot more, you know, that will change. Uh, and this time the change will not take 30 years. Uh, I think it will come much faster. Now, just imagine, you know, what can technology do to banking? And just imagine taking a loan in the future may become as easy as asking Alexa to play your favorite song or, you know, changing an address, you know, which many of us find it quite cumbersome to go to our banks and, you know, give all the forms could be as easy as changing your profile in Facebook. Now, this is not fiction, you know, from the future. This is possible today with the available technology. And there are some banks around the world, I would say, who are leading the change, but a lot of fintechs are coming in to provide these kinds of services. Now, to illustrate my point further, uh, what I've done is I've taken the liberty of creating a user journey because ultimately banking has to you know, address real user needs in the day-to-day -day life of people. So here's a, you know, a, a consumer of banking services, Ranjit. Uh, living in Colombo, 
and Ranjit has just recently shifted homes. And when he opens his bank app, the bank app is proactively able to suggest to him that the nearest branch to your new address is the Colombo Central you know, Bank branch. Do you want to just change your, your home branch to this branch? And with the click of a button, that change happens. On another day, you know, Ranjit wants to just check his you know, balances. And you know, he's able to just ask Alexa, uh, what's my bank balance? And not only does Alexa give him the bank balance, but Alexa can also say proactively on its own that, look, there is a, a credit card due that's, that's due today. Do you want to pay? And the authorization can happen through voice biometric and a password happens on Alexa. The, the bill is paid. On another day, uh, you know, the bank app proactively prompts Ranjit saying a lot of money is lying in your checking account or savings account in this case, earning only 2%. Or do you want to transfer a two or term deposit at 4%? Or do you want to check a whole host of mutual funds that we can recommend so that you can make more money? On another day, you know, Ranjit wants to travel to London and he tells Alexa, can you please book tickets for me? And the response he gets is that, should I also enable a travel insurance and enable international transactions on your card? And again, the authentication is on the bank app. All the transactions can happen seamlessly and he gets all the messages on the WhatsApp. Now we can go on with many, many more such journeys. Now, underlying all these different journeys, the question is how can traditional banks enable these kind of user experiences for their customers? And it actually boils down to only three things. First is really reimagining all the different user journeys from scratch. We call it end-to-end -end reimagination and digitization of consumer journeys. Second one is use of data analytics at scale. And third one is to really provide personalized and digital sales for all products to the customer. And I'll spend a few minutes on all these three themes, starting from the end-to-end -end digitization. Most banks around the world think about products, right? I have a range of products and what product can I sell to customers? I think that in the new world, it's not about the products but it's really about a customer journey. And as we saw in the example, many times, the journey does not start by a customer thinking about a bank. The journey can start by thinking about, I want to buy a car, or I want to buy a home, or I want to buy a mobile phone on Amazon, right? The banking service is an integral part of a larger real life user journey. And as big banks think about these journeys, they can reimagine all these journeys. And there are two critical lenses here. Lens one, that internally within the bank, the entire journey end to end needs to be fully reimagined and digital. For that to happen, the credit risk, one of the biggest element about banks taking time is to be able to assess the credit of customers. Can that be fully automated, AI enabled? Can the entire journey be straight through without any human intervention, right? Can all the transaction reconciliation happen automatically. Uh, the products actually are designed for these digital journeys and all across the bank, every single system is integrated. For the end customer, what that means is that the customer is allowed a hundred person self-service. There is no need to go to any physical branch that the customer gets a very personalized experience. It's not a mass market app. The pricing and the offers are tailored to the customer and the customer is able to use any channel of his or her choice. So that's the, the first element around reimagining all the journeys. The second element is the power of data. Now banks around the world are sitting on loads and loads of data. One of the studies that BCG had done, we found that only 30% or 35% of all the data that's available with the banks, the banks actually use it. 20% of the data they don't even collect, right? And a lot of other data is actually unused. And if you look at it, there is a rise of fintechs around the world. And these fintechs are getting humongous amount of valuations. In many markets, fintechs are today valued more than the traditional banks. 
And if you ask all the investors, why are the fintechs valued more? It's because the investors believe that these fintechs can actually monetize the data better than banks. But in reality, the fintechs don't have the same richness of data that banks have. Banks actually get the best customer data, which is possible because all your transactions are routed through a bank. So if banks were to unlock the power of data, then they can create huge amount of value for themselves and for the customers. Now to be able to do it, there are three important elements. One, banks have to think about outcomes or use cases. How can they use the data that they already have? The second, what is the technology and data architecture that's required? And of course, most importantly, do they have the right human capability to be able to unlock this data? Moving on to my point number three, I talked about personalization. And you know, one name that comes when you think about personalization that all of us have experienced is Netflix. It's a very simple example. You log on to Netflix and you don't know what to see. Like right? they always have a recommendation for you that is personalized and customized by your viewing experience. And the level of customization in Netflix is such that it not just chooses the best show for you, in this case, for example, Stranger Things, but even the graphic, the picture, the, you know, the what you see in terms of the logo of the same show actually varies by different profiles of people, depending on what your, you know, uh, what your profile is. So if you like scary things, you may, you may see a picture on the bottom left, but if you like, you know, teenage shows, you may see the picture on, on top middle, right? So that's the level of customization that uh, a company like Netflix is able to. Now, if you come to banks, most banks, you know, around the world, they do basic segmentation. They do segmentation basis, you know, mass market, emerging market, affluent, private banking. That's the level of segmentation that many banks do. Some of them are moving to personas beyond income saying that, look, are you millennial? Are you middle age? You know, what's your life cycle? But truly speaking, when you want to do personalization, it has to be a segment of one, a segment of one where every customer is different. I'm not defined just by my age or my income, right? I'm defined by who I am in terms of my personal needs, my behaviors, right? Can the bank customize their entire outreach to me versus my personal preference. If the banks are able to do this using data, then they can really mirror in the old age when I would visit my nearest bank branch, I would like to visit the branch manager who knows me personally. Now that I'm not visiting a branch, but I'm visiting an app right, or interacting with Alexa, I would want the same level of personalization in the digital media, which is possible through the use of data. Now, just to, to talk about if all of these good things have to happen in the background, what kind of technology are there today that can enable these kind of efficient and you know uh, experiences for the user that are delightful? There are many, many technologies out there. For example, uh, artificial intelligence in terms of natural la language processing, in terms of voice biometrics, uh, in many markets, what we're seeing that this technology is really maturing. Security in terms of tokenization, uh, open ecosystems, APIs, uh, you know, blockchain, uh, smart processing in terms of robotics, uh, process automation, and finally, Internet of Things. Now, these are all technologies that are maturing at a very fast pace. Uh, the big challenge is how do you make use of these technologies in the banking context to be able to provide delightful experience for our customers. Uh, I'll finish my presentation by just one page. So what does it all mean for our bankers? How do they make this real transition happen in the bank? It's not all about technology. It comes down to three simple things and we call it a simple framework, the head, the heart, and the hands. The head is where you define the vision for the bank. You imagine three years, five years on the line, what kind of a bank? can you become? What kind of experience can you provide to your customers? Heart is where you really empower, you really inspire your organization to say, look, we can do it. Because ultimately, people, banking is a very people-centric you know, centric business. If people, are, are, our own employees are not aligned with this vision, then this vision will not happen. And then the last thing, also very critical is hands. We need the right capabilities. 
So inspiration alone is not enough. We need the right capabilities, both in terms of newer capabilities, but also upskilling our existing employees. I'll stop here, Oliver. Uh, thank you for this time. And I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Rutin. That was that was an excellent presentation. It 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 looks like a bright new world, and I look forward to uh, to Netflix banking. So uh, we have our second speaker. Um, he actually doesn't need much of an introduction because he's uh, he's very famous within the ABA community. It is Datuk Michael Lor. Uh, he joins us today from Cambodia. Datuk Michael is the Senior Advisor Asia Pacific for the European Financial Management Association. And in his presentation, he today will talk about the digital transformation of SME banking. Datuk Michael, please go ahead. Yes, one second. He said he will be on online. Sorry, I was muted. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? You can yes. hear me now. All right, thanks. Thanks, Oliver. And thanks to ABA for giving us the opportunity. Um, just a quick uh, brief. The, the COVID pandemic had indeed caused a significant shift in the manner by which we are interacting today. I, I mean, the fact that uh, we are not able to attend an ABA conference, clearly things have changed. Can you imagine what more in the interactions between customers and their financial services providers? Uh, some of you who may notice I didn't say banks, I said financial services providers. And this is often referred to as the new normal. I think you're all fed up of listening to the word new normal. The question is, are we ready for our customers? Now, in the many, many years, I think five to 10 years ago, we have always looked at digital for personal customers. And this is quite ingrained in this region with innovative mobile apps and payment conveniences. Um, some of them are not really money making though, uh, but that is a story for another day. But for the most profitable segment of many banks in this region, um, the SME segment, digital readiness of financial service providers are generally lackluster. I mean, I've had the opportunity of meeting with many, many banks in this region, uh, online, offline, I mean, before COVID. It is interesting that whenever you meet with banks, generally we are talking about um, digital innovations for the personal segment and rather than the SME segment. Uh, very quickly, um, um, sorry, I, I can't move. Okay, very quickly, um, FMA, FMA is a non profit organization basically comprises of members in a strong community. Um, it was created in 1971 and currently we have close to 120 financial group members uh, represented in 133 countries. I mean, it's run by a board that has been elected among the members uh, themselves. Uh, this is about myself. I don't want to go too much in it. Suffice to say is to let you know that I'm currently speaking to you from Cambodia. Uh, and uh, the great thing is in Cambodia is that we have no lockdown and I can still play golf. Um, so things are good. All right. Now, digital transformation of SME banking. Now, during the pre-COVID era, SMEs were already experiencing multiple pain points and primarily being um, the digital readiness of their banks, the digital readiness of their financial service providers. And very often, um, they don't really want to see their bankers, but the fact is that um, their banks are just not ready. And you couple that now with COVID and um, people just don't want to visit the branches. Um, so this has made things a little bit more um, difficult for many SME customers and in particular, um, many banks and, and customers. Now, clearly SME banking is on the edge of a fundamental change, um, reviewing the need for transformation. And currently we are seeing banks that are winning are basically banks that are, uh, they have integrated their solutions for SMEs, all right? Not, it is no longer just about providing financial services. It is also providing solutions, non-financial solutions, advisory solutions for SMEs. 
And uh, banks have also started to start to help SMEs uh, in their own digitization uh, requirements. So the value proposition has basically changed a little bit for banks in this current, uh, uh, this current environment. And we can now see that a lot of SMEs are now demanding that um, their financial services partners have the ability to provide them this additional assistance as they also start to grapple with their customers' own needs for digitalization. And guess what? The only, the only difference is that with COVID, it kind of makes everything a little bit more uh, um, urgent, uh, a little bit more needed right now because um, many of the SME's own customers do not want to visit the SME's themselves. Now, this was a research done, I think, uh, in, in, by, by EFMA, and it, it, it was findings of 40 senior SME bankers from around the globe, um, just to understand what are the challenges they are facing and what actually works for them currently. Now, the nature of SS, SMEs often mean that um, many of them require financing. They require credit facilities. So it is not surprising to see that more than 60% um, actually says that accessible to financing is critical for their customers. But because of the nature of SMEs often means minimal credit history, all right? And therefore banks are now struggling to see how they can better tap into their unused data. Um, I think my colleague earlier mentioned about they have a trove of data which is hardly used. How do they make use of this data to better serve this segment? And of course, you can see in the other shaded uh, circles around there um, that SME customers today are also looking for other non-financial advisory services, um, cash management products, um, BFM tools, invoicing, accounting, and so on and so forth. So, Compared to the personal segment, the SME segment is rather a mixed batch of needs and requirements. And banks basically need to respond all right, to these varied needs. Now, if you, if you think about the personal customers, maybe about five years ago, you give them a great mobile app, great user experience, great user interface, um, everybody is happy. And then you come to the SME segment today and you realize that you know, all these great things doesn't really make them happy. All right, because their needs and their demands are a little bit more diverse, um, a little bit more varied. And, and, and as, as, as what was mentioned earlier too, I, I think banks also continue to face significant challenges from fintech competition. And somehow these non-traditional providers are much more stronger in the areas of payments all right, and banks are feeling immense pressure from these challenger providers, and it basically allows an opportunity for SME customers to basically say, I can do this somewhere else. Um, it is not in this deck, but there was a research that I have seen, I think last year we, we presented it to some of our members. Interestingly, a large portion of SME customers being surveyed basically says they were prepared to switch banks um, to another provider who is able to provide them digital solutions. And, and, and the interesting thing is um, they don't mind paying for it. All right, they're okay to pay for it. They just want to make sure that their financial services providers can do it in a more digital manner. So as I mentioned just now, digitalizing for the SME segment is a little bit more complicated than digitalizing for the personal segment. Is no longer just building a mobile app and building a QR code and everybody is happy. The question is that their needs are so varied, their requirements are so diverse. So I, I want to quote the SME or the, the Jack Dimoji, the head of SME at Rabobank, that often at the time when, when you need things fast and if someone else has a better solution, uh, it is important that we don't try to build it ourselves, but partner a company that has already developed a solution to the problem. The critical issue of digitalization for the SME segment is speed and the fact that many banks have ignored the needs of this segment for way too long. And therefore, this has created a gap of needs from their own customers. 
and a gap for fintech providers to basically encroach in aggressively. The solution now is for banks to capitalize on their strengths. We mentioned about data. We mentioned about trust. I think banks have fantastic trust as far as their customers are concerned. Strong capital and funding for credit. International correspondent relationships. So as banks, we have certain strengths within ourselves that is being recognized by our SME customers. And we now need to match this strength with our digital solution providers. And that's the fastest way by which they can reach the market. So SMEs are expecting beyond just financial services, more critical is to assist them to digitalize and to serve their needs for non-financial advisory services and solutions. Some of the examples are presented in the slides. Now, if you look at some of these non-financial services, you realize that these are definitely not the strength for banks. These are not the strength for traditional banks. Many banks don't do this, all right? So by this, we can simply conclude that partnership is thus important. Otherwise, it is going to be much more slower, much more difficult for banks um, to reach their needs of the SME customers. Now, the next few slides are basically case studies. I will just go through them very quickly. I, I, um, some of you who are members of FMA, you can actually go to the portal and you can read this in, in depth um, because in the interest of time. Uh, we have ABN Embro, ABN Embro developed products for the SMEs. And what is interesting is New10 is the 100% digital funding platform for SMEs. Basically, they linked it to government guarantees. So in fact, I was quite, quite interested in this because um, presently I'm advising the Cambodian government on their um, credit guarantee corporation. And we're trying to see whether we can find banks to actually link this um, into their lending platform. All right, and of course you have, to, I don't know how to pronounce this, Tiki Zeklik, uh, I hope I'm right, uh, basically using a WhatsApp payment channel, all right, and so on. And then you have Bank Okrite. Bank Okrite is basically one of the largest bank in Russia, collaborating with Tiger. Tiger is basically a Singapore-based fintech providers um, and basically developing a seamless payment solution for the SME client. So to the SME client, they have increased productivity, better customer experience for the bank. They onboard more SME clients, they increase revenue. So this is interesting. You look at a partnership because this allows them to reach the market faster, all right? Collaborating on the strength of each other. And then you have MasterCard and Visita. Visita basically is a learning app um, they create bite-sized lessons where business owners can learn from the challenges and successes of other business owners. Um, so there is peer-to-peer -peer sharing in the SME community um, using this particular um, collaboration between MasterCard and Visita. Um, this is another partnership between Nationwide and uh, Bankify, a business management platform. Basically, if you allow them to do things like invoicing, accounting, cash forecasting, all right? Again, you see this partnership between Nationwide and uh, Bankify, which is basically a fintech provider in order to reach the customers uh, of Nationwide. Um, Square banking, this is, this is interesting. Now, if you, you saw you have time, if you go to squareup.com, um, squareup.com, basically this organization has a complete suite of products from commerce, customer affinity solutions, HR solutions, app development, marketing solutions, and now they are into banking. All right. So recently, I think just probably within this year, they basically uh, developed three core products designed to help small business owners to manage their cash flow, savings, checking, and so on and so forth. So we can see that there are a lot of fintech providers out there. They have basically moved beyond what do they generally do, all right, and encroach into the banking space. Um, Oliver, that's the last of my slide. And uh, thank you very much. And um, yeah, I look forward to questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Datuk Michael. Um, again, uh, also an excellent presentation. I, I very much like that you incorporated uh, a lot of the customer views and kind of outlined what uh, or outline the homework we as we as banks have to do to meet 
um, these customers' expectations. Thank you. We're coming to our um, third speaker now. Our third speaker is Michael Araneta. Michael is the head of advisory and research at the International Data Corporation Financial Insights. And in his presentation, he will discuss what the big areas of tech investments tell us about how we are changing. Michael, please go ahead. Well, pleasant uh, afternoon to everyone. I'm very happy to be presenting to you today um, in an area um, that is, of course, very core to IDC. IDC is the leading uh, research company worldwide that looks at technology spending. And the team that I represent, IDC Financial Insights, look at the patterns of spending, the drivers for IT and technology-related spending uh, for financial services. Uh, so this pieces of research that I'm going to talk about is really a, a conglomeration of the several um, initiatives that we have to really understand uh, why we are spending on technology, what we are spending on, and what are the implications for banks uh, as we continue that spending. But obviously, there's a lot of things that I will need to talk about if we're just going to talk about technology priorities. So I have oriented my presentation today uh, to talk about the big areas of tech investments. Uh, and by big, I think that there are different dimensions of how exactly we really measure the size or significance of uh, technology investments. I will talk about uh, the area of technology spending that is receiving high growth. So I'm talking about the highest growth technology area for 2021 uh, and uh, comparing that to 2020. That will also be followed by a presentation that I will have on the area that uh, of technology spending that is encouraging a lot of spending together. And I'm just going to talk about uh, the programs, uh, the technology transformation area that is receiving a lot of attention. And then finally, as a third theme, in terms of big area of tech investments, I'm going to talk about the key themes uh, that would be uh, the biggest theme that I think is uh, driving technology investments in 2021, also in anticipation for a very interesting 2022. So let me begin by talking about, again, the biggest area of uh, growth, just in terms of percentage growth, one of them, and there are two, uh, the first one is AIML, which I, we, we will talk about later on, but the biggest technology spending area, I think of note for 2021 over 2022 is cloud. And in specific, if you, if you just really look at the numbers, um, cloud budgets continue to grow with 92% of the Asia Pacific uh, financial services institutions uh, would look at increasing their cloud spend in 2022 compared to 89% in 2020. So there's definitely a lot of interest in cloud. But if you look at public cloud in specific, it's uh, 29%, the highest that we've ever seen, and probably the highest um, in terms of uh, growth. Also considering that uh, the IT budgets of many financial institutions would be on a moderate growth cycle at this point. Obviously, we're seeing an economic down cycle that uh, will need to be responded to by maybe a reduction in IT budgets. But look at that 29% that is being uh, shown in the category of public cloud. If you actually really look at the numbers more and why these financial institutions are spending on cloud, one of them obviously would be cost takeouts and cost efficiencies, uh, but that's not necessarily the biggest driver of all. It is about the access to innovation uh, and the ability of uh, cloud to be able to support scale uh, and be more reliable as we support maybe the growth in tr digital transactions, but also the growth uh, in the banks that we are witnessing. But something that is also very interesting to watch out for in 2021 uh, up to 2023, you actually will see a big inflection point in the types of cloud that we are using. And that means that if you look at 2023, you look at single cloud usage at only 7%, uh, and then multi-cloud usage at 27%. Multi-cloud here would mean lit little to no interoperability. Um, and then 
39% uh, for those multi-cloud strategies that would have uh, interoperability, and then finally hybrid cloud with full interoperability. I wanted to call this out, uh, not only this 29% growth, but I wanted to really paint the picture that uh, our vision of cloud as a financial services institutions is not necessarily tied to one uh, company or one cloud services provider. The future of cloud will obviously be uh, strong growth in cloud, but it will actually be of greater openness to the use of cloud services providers. So we're not going to be beholden to uh, one uh, or two companies. We will use this multiple uh, uh, cloud services providers and their uh, propositions. So watch out for that. That is a, something that we would really like to, um, I think, uh, uh, emphasize that the uh, future of cloud is all about interoperability, how all these applications and workloads that we are going to put on cloud will need to work on different environments so that you can shift from one cloud to the next next with great interoperability, but with a seamless capability as well. There is no statistical difference between interoperability between hosted private cloud uh, with public cloud versus public uh, cloud moving to public cloud. What I just would really like to emphasize here is that the future of cloud is going to be about this open uh, cloud uh, that we uh, I think will be useful as we transition from one cloud or one environment to the next. A very interesting twist to um, one of our assumptions that, uh, that cloud will create um, more lock-in to one vision or one architectural or one a technology framework of the cloud services providers. Rather, this will be a more open cloud usage. So um, that takes care of the first thing that I'd like to emphasize today in terms of growth and in terms of just the significance in terms of shifts and priorities, uh, cloud is really accelerating, but the uh, use of cloud and how we adopt cloud moving forward is definitely going to be a lot more open. Which segues to the second area that I think would really need to be talked about, which is that of open banking. Let me just go through uh, this, uh, how transformative open banking has just really been for us. Um, in the Asia Pacific region, there's been a lot of um, movements with regard to strategies of banks uh, in relation to open banking. For us to say that there is really a resurgence or reacceleration of open banking initiatives. I think that over the past two years of this uh, COVID-19 and this down cycle that we are in, we have been distracted by um, other more important things, obviously, stability and just making sure that we do not bear the full impact of this down cycle. But open banking is slowly and steadily and I think surely uh, coming up in a very big way. If you look at some developments in Hong Kong, in South Korea, uh, in Taiwan and the Philippines, of course, the continuation of open banking in Singapore as well as Australia, there does seem to be a critical mass of these regulations and regulation light type of initiatives that will encourage more open banking. But I would also like to say that there have been three transformations with regard to open banking uh, that transforms our industry um, very, very significantly. Um, and Michael Lowe's presentation earlier did say that it's not just banks or financial institutions. These are financial services providers or those that are capable of providing a financial service. And that is open banking for you. It, it's not just those with a banking license, but it could be those that participate in a financial service. But transformationally, I think uh, open banking has been significant because it breaks down our traditional notions of banking. First, greater openness to collaborate. Um, if you look at the left-hand side, it has us, for, uh, us surrounded by them. That depicts the picture of how we as financial services institutions are moving away from the concept of us versus them towards us together with them. And by them, we mean those institutions or those uh, partners, the trusted third parties that we have to work with that would uh, continue to uh, be the sources of innovation, but will be the sharers and receivers of shared data functionalities, as well as uh, application capability in the spirit of open banking. A lot of that would be created through the second transformation, which, which is platforms for data monetization. What this second picture in the middle actually depicts is the ability of the institution to share data 
and sometimes data-based innovation between your institution as a bank and other third parties. And these third parties can be uh, maybe your fintechs, uh, maybe specific financial services institutions that you have uh, collaborations with or bilateral uh, business relationships with. This could be other ecosystems like digital services providers, um, maybe some e-commerce companies that would need to acquire uh, your data or share their data as well. Uh, Michael Lowe was earlier talking about how all of these uh, data sharing frameworks uh, allow us to really extend financial services uh, in a very big way to more and more of our customers, usually through uh, SMEs as well, uh, allowing these SMEs to finally have uh, good data that they uh, will re really use as a representation of their ability to pay, uh, but also their willingness to pay. Hopefully, these transformations allow us also to create frictionless financial services, the third transformation that we are seeing in open banking, which allows financial services to be embedded into the day-to-day -day life of the customers. Um, and this uh, can allow us to work with other industries uh, so that financial services does not exist in and of itself. It has never existed in and of itself anyway, but it allows financial services, whether it's lending or deposits or payments, to be truly embedded in the value chains or in the uh, other lifestyle services that our customers are participating in. These three depictions of open banking uh, really underscore how open banking is not just a regulatory-led initiative, but it is a transformational uh, initiative for many of our organizations and for our industry at large. The technology implications here would be also interesting. Some of them have been mentioned here as pending associated to open banking. First, API and API management. That was a big area of spending that we had prior to COVID-19. And I think that this is starting to also grow in terms of prominence. A lot of this API and API management, some of the API uh, gateways are really underpinned by all these open uh, and, and uh, hybrid cloud strategies too. Security, a big area of spending, because let's also remember that the sharing of this data and information between the bank, uh, this data and information owned by the customer, obviously, uh, to other third parties will need to be done in a secure manner. And there are standards for APIs, whether it's standards for data exchange access, as well as transfer of all those data. Collaboration platforms, how exactly are we going to uh, make sure that the functionalities created out of open banking can uh, be accessed by the third parties? Collaboration platform uh, will be able to facilitate that. Alternative data, uh, resolving this biggest issue of lack of data and current accurate and reliable data that shows the true state of the customer, most of these can be provided by the fintechs that would also have some alternative data. And if you marry that with the rich data of the customer, then you can make those appropriate decisions about lending or marketing, cross-sell, upsell, or fraud management, if that is the need of the time. And then underpinning that will be data management to make sure that the data that we uh, share uh, and the mechanism of, of data sharing will be done in a very governed fashion. So transformational related spending, open banking is the theme, uh, but this would be underpinned by several spending uh, areas, API management down to data management. And also very interesting as a third point that I'd like to have for this presentation is that we are looking at the ultimate theme uh, that drives technology spending for 2021 uh, and maybe in the lead up to 2022, this will also be relevant. From a spending perspective, we are seeing uh, the theme of stability and reliability. At first, I was thinking maybe this is part of the resiliency theme that seemed to be very popular anywhere uh, in financial services or in other industries as well. And I think IDC, as an IDC analyst, we are very sensitive to the big buzzwords of our time. A digital transformation obviously was one big phenomenon that we, we tried to define and, and we've been successful in defining to the market. But 
recently there has been this upsurge of everything resiliency or resilience, uh, howsoever you want to taxonomize it. But ultimately what this resiliency actually means for us as uh, bankers would be uh, the stability and reliability of a financial service. Uh, there has been an intensif intensification of trends in 20, uh, that we saw in 2020, uh, that we see progress in 2021 of the ability of financial services to simply deliver. And this would have implications to other areas of technology spending that would include fraud management, risk analytics, security, as well as uptime. I will go through these five blocks of uh, technology spending in relation to stability and uh, reliability. First, uh, this ability of our institution to be able to deal with its upsurge of digital, digital transactions. In 2020, we saw 50% growth of digital transactions over the previous year. In 2021, this year, we are seeing, in fact, greater than 50%, even if we are already uh, uh, working off a higher base in 2020, just in terms of digital transactions. There's also this new modes of customer interactions that change the way that we uh, speak with or deal with customers. New products that are being launched that create all these uh, new digital transactions obviously aligned with what Ruchin was earlier talking about in terms of new customer journeys that are being undertaken or designed. Um, also a big driver of uh, technology spending last year was work from home or back to the office at a day's notice that was the benchmark last year. But many of our organizations have been using different types of applications that are being used um, in the home environment. And we use that in conjunction with our day-to-day -day work uh, in financial services. Uh, there has to be a balance in that. And I think there's uh, investments in virtualization or security, uh, also VPN, that also is uh, responding to the need of our time. I already mentioned cloud, and that is the third block there, the one in the middle, 85% of tier one and tier two institutions are creating an essentially hybrid cloud strategy um, that I think is the theme that I earlier talked about. And then greater integration of operations. Another big buzzword is anything operations. If you talk about DevOps, DevSecOps, AI ops, risk ops, uh, fraud ops, and any data ops related initiative, there is that move towards greater integration of a bank uh, so that not only are we able to innovate and develop uh, all these innovations in technology, but we're able to operationalize it as quickly as possible. And then finally, the growth of AI and ML, as well as the growth of this application portfolio is very interesting that we are renovating the uh, banking uh, systems, whether it's core banking or this surrounding systems uh, around uh, the core banking system, but there is this growth of application portfolios that is also very interesting. Uh, that allows us to say that although there's a downturn in the uh, real economy, there is in fact an upsurge in technology spending to uh, maybe respond to the needs of the time, but also to prepare for recovery. But what is the linkage to this theme of stability and reliability? And I think that ultimately all of these lead us to uh, understand that in relation to all this technology spending, we are spending to ensure first that we prevent all adverse scenarios. That if we succeed as banks, we will use technologies not only to uh, prevent maybe uh, closure of a business that we have funded or maybe uh, we manage our balance sheets very well. Uh, this is the prevention of all adverse incidences, uh, whether it's security related, availability related, and so on. Consistency of views and operations and data across various environments are very important too, because we are operating in this cloud world. Um, ultimately, we need to make sure that we have a view of what really is happening in our operations. And then finally, uh, the ability of our institution to uh, have visibility of what is happening, through greater use of intelligence and transparency of response. In conclusion, what I'd like to say is that our technology spending has never been more unique, but the, it is unique from the perspective of growth despite an economic uh, down cycle. But this, are, this technology spending trends that we are seeing at IDC actually portray a financial services banking that is really changing for good. 
One of them is around that of choice. Remember, many of our institutions are uh, choosing this open uh, cloud framework. We're not going to be beholden to one cloud framework or one cloud services provider. We will operate based on choice. And the choices of cloud and choices of, of cloud environment that we'll have will really depend on the type of banks or the type of initiatives that we are pursuing. There's greater openness and collaboration in open banking. And then finally, this pursuit of stability and reliability. Those are the big trends in uh, technology spending that we see at IDC, but those, these three are ultimately how we are changing as an industry. I'll be happy to take questions later on, but I think uh, we will have time for a, a panel as well. Thank you. Back to you, Oliver. Thank you, Michael. I think that was a, a really a great overview uh, on all the major topics and you really touched on the major themes we, we are looking at in, in, in the context of, of our today's theme, uh, technology and banking. So we are now, uh, we now will be joined by three panelists and also industry experts on, on today's uh, topic. Let me just introduce them to you briefly. We have uh, Luis Vogler, who is the global head of banks and broker dealers corporate in the commercial an institutional banking client coverage of Standard Chartered Bank. Louise joins us from her nice quarantine <laughs> hotel room in Hong Kong. Um, we have Neeraj Maskara, who is a partner in the technology and consulting practice of Ernst & Young Advisory. Uh, he's dialing in from Singapore. And our round is completed by Hochat Sheikh Kata, the co-founder of Tech to Change um, in the Netherlands, who is joining us today from Lugano in, in Switzerland. So welcome to, to all of you. Um, Luis, let's, let's start with, uh, with a question to you. Based on your experience at, at Standard Chartered, what role would you attribute to technology in making financial products and financial services more accessible, particularly for, for SMEs and in emerging markets. So great, thank you, Oliver. So um, yeah, from our from our perspective as a, as a banking practitioner in, in this market, um, there, there are really four areas that we see technology really uh, driving a lot of change uh, and, and benefiting uh, access uh, to financial services for SMEs. Um, one is around the development of new products and services, and we've, 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 we've touched on some of those through the previous presentations. The second is actually also um, new and innovative market infrastructure, including blockchain, for instance, uh, in, in being able to um, process payments. The third would be in risk management, um, and that goes to using uh, data and um, AI to, to make quicker and better quality credit decisions for accessing credit. And then last would be client access. And what we mean by that is, is onboarding and, and, and being able to onboard uh, SMEs um, uh, into, into the banking ecosystem. So um, of those four areas, I, I think particularly for SMEs, um, two that are really interesting is around how technology is helping improve the ability to onboard um, SME clients um, and then accelerating uh, the ability to approve a credit um, uh, and accessing credit and, and, and uh, finance. And, and, and as particularly for SMEs and, and, and micro, micro um, uh, uh, business institutions in emerging markets, historically uh, for, for banks, access uh, to data, accessibility of data, as well as the transparency of information in, in emerging markets is, is, is often not that, 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 that good. And so being able to use technology to help banks make better quality decisions, uh, that really is a huge benefit for SMEs in, in the region. And just think also around uh, technology in uh, being able to also help reduce cost of onboarding and client maintenance using uh, automation and um, algorithmic driven solutions. This also helps banks reduce the cost of onboarding uh, and client maintenance where in the past, perhaps that was uh, not accessible uh, from a bank cost perspective. So I'll just give a quick example, if I can, of how we brought this to life and how uh, one of the solutions we have that can, can uh, manifest these, uh, these, these areas where we see um, technology helping SMEs. Standard Chartered has launched um, in, in India uh, a platform called Solve, S-O-L-V, 
SOLV without the E solved. And this is basically a closed loop uh, B2B e-commerce platform that it's a basically an integrated uh, commercial and credit and working capital finance marketplace. And it brings uh, small retailers together with domestic suppliers in India, along with logistic providers and then participating banks and financial uh, services providers. So there's a financing engine and then there's a commercial exchange and inventory logistics engine. So how does this, how does Solve then reflect the positive impact of, of, of technology? So basically in three ways. So Solve will help accelerate um, the speed of onboarding um, and activating uh, the platform participants. And secondly, uh, through the platform, uh, data visibility improves um, and financing decisions um, from, from the financial services providers are, is quicker. And then third, data visibility helps for more efficient inventory management, which ultimately reduces the end-to-end -end cost of a, of, of a domestic trade transaction. So um, in summary, technology acts as a really powerful uh, enabler, um, and it makes it easier for under uh, service companies or underbanked companies in emerging markets to access financial services that, that they need. And these are just two manifestations through this uh, example I gave on Sol. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I, I saw that, that Standard Chartered has, has partnered with, with quite a number of, of fintechs. I, I would say maybe you have some more examples for us uh, of what you did in that space. And also what I, what I as a banker would be interested in what, what is important in, in a relationship between normally a big bank like yours and then probably a much smaller fintech to make that relationship work, to make it successful? Yeah, that's an excellent question, um, Oliver. So, and happy to share some examples. And maybe I'll start first with um, what, what, what works and what doesn't work or some of the, yeah, the, yeah. the keys of success with a big, you know, well-established institution like a bank partnering with a, a very... Um, innovative fintech. Um, so I, I think on, on what works, um, there, there are two things to, to, to really think about. One is, um, and underpinning this is sort of transparency around the goals of a partnership, as well as the process. And, and so there are two aspects, goals and the process. So starting on the process side, um, you know, of course, when you're partnering with a fintech, which is very fast moving and, and very innovative, you need to try and keep things simple as possible. But in large banks, such as Standard Chartered, um, there's a need to balance um, between preserving, say, the integrity of your risk processes, such as your financial crime compliance uh, requirements, AML sanctions, et cetera, um, as well as being quick to market and, and the speed and, and, and sort of making sure that things are simple. So it's very important at the outset when partnering with a fintech to make sure that there is some um, uh, a real alignment uh, around the risk control philosophy uh, and if there's a major mismatch, mismatch in expectations, then that, that means that, you know, it'll be a bit challenging, but certainly making sure that there's an alignment around process. And I think also banks, established banks like Standard Charter, we, we actually play an important positive role with our fintech partners uh, in educating around sort of global financial crime uh, prerogatives, such as AML um, sanctions and payment transparency. And that ultimately is a win-win for the overall integrity of the global uh, payment system overall. So that's one on process, making sure that there's clear, clear alignment there. Then second is around goals. Um, and again, agreeing on the key goals of the partnership upfront uh, and prior to actually designing a proof of concept. And then trying to design key metrics um, that you can jointly agree on to make sure you can measure what success looks like. So those are some of the sort of the two the two um, areas to really watch out for when when forming a partnership with fintechs. <laughs> and now I'll just share, if I can, indulge me a bit to share some of the examples that we've uh, had at Standard Chartered and how we've partnered with fintechs um, in the in the region. And I think some of these examples go to the heart of what Dr. Michael was talking about around how you want to blend. Um, you know, the strengths of the bank with the strengths of, of, of fintechs uh, in order to provide innovative solutions to SMEs in the region. So the first is um, uh, we have a collaboration with uh, Sunrate Solutions in China to support Chinese importers uh, to make outward payments uh, to their overseas suppliers uh, using a, a one-stop intelligent payment solution. And it primarily the value add here is uh, providing these importers with a convenient FX conversion solution at competitive FX rates. Uh, so in a nutshell, we try and speed up the cross-border outward remittance for, you know, for importers to their offshore suppliers. Um, another example we have, uh, again in China, is a deep, a deep tier uh, supply chain financing solution. Uh, we've partnered uh, with Link Logis in China uh, to provide a deep tier supply chain financing, financing alternative um, in Guangdong. 
uh, in Guangdong province and uh, it uses blockchain technology. And the solution here leverages on a digital services platform called Digital Guangdong. And this is a, a platform that provides digital information services to various government entities in Guangdong. And basically the platform allows suppliers to then provide services to uh, various entities of the Guangdong government. So this platform gives full visibility um, to digital Guangdong, uh, the procurement entities in that platform. On the first tier, uh, direct suppliers, but also you can obtain further information on their upstream suppliers so that we're able to, uh, through what we call a digital, digital payment order, allow that DPO to be transferred to upstream smaller suppliers who can then go to a bank and access financing through that closed loop ecosystem so that we can go from tier one supplier down to tier N as long as we can use that digital payment order uh, to, access, to allow the, the upstream suppliers to get financing. Another example we have is uh, SCB has launched uh, Nexus, which is our own version of banking as a service. Um, and basically Nexus can be plugged into other closed loop e-commerce platforms um, on a white labeling basis. Um, and the example I have here is um, in Indonesia, we have partnered with, um, uh, with uh, uh, Bukalak Bukalapak, which is uh, Indonesia's uh, leading uh, B2B e-commerce uh, platform. And so they basically use our, um, our uh, Nexus as a, as a, as a financing uh, sort of engine. Lastly, we've been in collaboration with uh, Ant Group in China uh, on their Trustful platform, which is a digital cross-border trade and trade finance platform using AntChain, which is Ant Group's blockchain-based uh, technology solution. And again, that's similar to uh, the example I gave earlier on in India with Solve, but this is a this is actually a cross-border uh, platform uh, that serves uh, across Asia, Chinese exporters and Asian importers, uh, and and solves for some quite complex cross-border trade finance uh, challenges that we usually meet, uh, and tries to improve the efficiency and transparency and trust within the process. So those are the examples that we've brought to life. Um, and, and I think all of them each show the ways in which we're trying to support SMEs in emerging markets to access um, services through technology. Great, thank you. There were some, some great examples and I think some, some very useful hints um, well, for, for banks and, and, and fintechs. Um, Neeraj, I have a, a rather broad question for you and it also it, it relates a bit uh, to to Michael's uh, Michael Arenata's uh, presentation given the increasing uh, role of, of new and emerging technologies for growth in banking which ones would you see as the most important ones or potentially the most successful ones those that are here to stay yeah thanks Oliver um, happy to Kind of share my views on that. Um, I think it's a bit of a loaded question. Uh, we have, uh, on the one hand, some of the disruptors and digital banks who are looking at this from a different spectrum. And then you've got the more traditional banks who sometimes have a differing point of view on it. But maybe the way we're seeing it in the market, uh, I'll probably approach that from three different lenses or three different agendas, uh, which might give some perspective on it. If you had to look at it, uh, in three ways. One of it is the growth agenda of a financial institution. The second being the protect agenda. And maybe a third agenda, which is fundamentally operational excellence or future proofing uh, the bank. And I think that's where some of the new and emerging technology and themes come more into play. There's probably some interesting observations that I can share. Um, certainly some of the more popular or more prevalent and prioritized ones. Um, some of them are more successful than others in terms of seeing the light of day, but, but I think still worthy of, uh, of observing uh, as we go along. <clears throat> so I think if you look at the growth agenda, um, it's, it, it's obviously primarily driven with the goal of elevating and differentiating customer experience for a financial institution. And examples of some of the more common priorities that we are seeing today among the um, banks um, are, for example, uh, seamless digital onboarding. Uh, the whole idea of an eKYC system, especially in the post-COVID world, is no longer um, um, a nice to have or something that is uh, acceptable as a value add, but it's becoming a norm. So I think a lot of the institutions are really migrating, if they're not already there, in either ensuring that they've adopted an eKYC process for digital onboarding or certainly simplifying what they already had. Um, so I think that's, that's certainly here and now. Um, 
One of the relatively newer areas that we're hearing about is, is the theme around passwordless authentication. Um, uh, essentially, the question of how can I use something like biometrics to replace the whole concept of usernames and passwords, which I'm sure all of us have far too many to keep track of, and to do it in a secure manner. And there's a number of emerging technology solutions that are now very actively being explored and deployed to improve that customer experience through passwordless authentications. Another interesting uh, topic that we think is uh, becoming very prevalent now is the whole topic of conversational banking. Effectively, how can I service my clients where they prefer to communicate and transact? So all the way from acquisition to onboarding, to advisory, to execution, how do I take that entire experience uh, to, for example, WhatsApp or WeChat or any other preferred platform to be able to give them the most seamless banking experience? Not, not easy. There's a lot of, of course, um, uh, considerations around audit and around security and all of those features, but certainly there's an evolution happening with new and emerging technologies driven by client demand and differentiation objectives that is moving in that direction and we're seeing a lot of movement over there. I think hyper-personalization, which was beautifully exemplified and described by Ruchin in his presentation, is an ever-prominent theme, and uh, there's a dime a dozen of different models and tools and technologies and out-of-the-box solutions that one can choose from. But I think the importance of um, uh, improving that more personalized content and product delivery just in time to your customers is going to really affect the uh, top line, bottom line, and customer retention uh, probability uh, for, uh, for most banks. So we're seeing a huge investment growth in that area. Uh, in terms of uh, leveraging technology to bring new and innovative products and services, uh, we're seeing a lot of focus on digital assets. So from, CD, uh, from, from CBDCs to cryptos to STOs, I think an entire um, asset class, if you'd like, in that regard, is certainly being an important um, product line or offering to start including um, among the banks. And uh, uh, one cannot lose sight of uh, the whole idea of sustainable investments and financing, uh, which is all about actually providing data-led insights on ESG uh, for clients, customers, and suppliers, which is becoming a very, very uh, important theme to leverage um, data, uh, emerging technology, analytics, and, uh, and actually ecosystem plays to be able to foster that. So I think... Certainly on the growth, we see some of these themes. On the protect agenda, um, uh, I think there are three themes that I'd probably exemplify right now. Fin crime is an ever rising um, and, and really a necessary battle that uh, most banks will continue to fight. And I think the ecosystem opportunities and the open API, um, uh, uh, if you'd like frameworks to prevent things like transaction fraud and money laundering are no longer becoming an option for a lot of the banks to be able to tackle some of these issues, it is becoming a norm. So we see a lot of investments flowing in that area. Cybersecurity cannot be understated. Um, uh, the, zero trust, the zero trust principles, uh, the least privileged um, identity access management principles, uh, the secure access server edge, um, embedding that into the cybersecurity practices. We're seeing some of these emerging cybersecurity teams uh, becoming very front and center on the agenda. And uh, then we've got aspirational themes such as compliance automation and outsourcing, where we're looking at compliance by design from first to third line of defenses that I think are um, dictating some of the protect agenda items on the emerging side. And finally, I would say like on the whole future proofing of the actual technology backbone of a lot of the banks, which I think touches on a number of key themes presented by uh, Michael Arenata. Uh, I think cloud adoption is uh, never seen as much uh, of readiness uh, today as, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, there was definitely a lot of hesitation in the past on migration to the cloud, and I think there still is. But like Michael pointed out, hybrid cloud seems to be an increasingly acceptable option. Uh, whether or not they'll move to public cloud entirely, I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis, but, but I think certainly cloud adoption is big on the agenda. All the things that were mentioned before around embedding DevSecOps and all the software development life cycles, adopting agile practices um, are obviously becoming a norm right now. 
And perhaps I'll just state also some things like uh, moving to microservices architectures and to low code based applications for faster time to market is again becoming uh, very, very important themes and embracing those practices more than technologies to be able to compete and thrive in the marketplace. So I'll probably just uh, close off on that note um, with my views, just saying that there is a myriad of solutions and choices out there from fully bespoke to PaaS to SaaS. And I think prioritization and alignment to the business is key in terms of rationalizing, defining the strategy, the roadmap and operating model. And most importantly, ensuring a very de-risked execution. And at least here at EVI, that's what we are really focusing on helping our clients across the financial services industry. Thank you, uh, Neeraj. Uh, there, there, there are two, uh, two topics I would like to pick your brain up a, a bit on and, and specifically with regard to, to Asian banks. How do you see them using or, or benefiting uh, from 5A, from 5G and the, the network coverage that, that uh, enables that and B from, of course, from blockchain. Everybody talks about blockchain. How do you see Asian banks using this or do you see them using it? That's an interesting one, uh, Oliver. So blockchain and 5G, well, uh, and I'll probably add IoT to that, especially in terms of complexity in the banking sector and really understanding how, how they can utilize that, especially in an Asian context. Um, I think there's been a lot of hype and mystery around uh, blockchain and 5G, especially in the banking sector. And a lot of the other sectors like manufacturing, utilities, uh, logistics, I think the use cases are a little bit more understandable if you'd like. But it's been a very interesting area for us to converse with a lot of the banks here in the region. And especially in Asia, this is perhaps a lot more interesting to uh, uh, iron out and to flush out because purely of the nature of the demography in Asia, the, the, the spread of the geography, uh, the type of uh, markets that are, uh, especially in ASEAN, um, India, China, a lot of these larger demographies, um, I think there's a lot of play over here. Let's take a moment to simplify and understand what's the core advantage offered by these two technology developments, right? Like with 5G, the fundamental opportunity is mainly to move data faster with higher capacity and greater bandwidth. Uh, particularly for edge computing and near band communications, this presents a revolutionary advantage on how data can be transferred from point to point and in real time. So we'll talk a moment about kind of how that can be leveraged in an Asian context. But then if you look at blockchain, it's fundamentally a technology or a platform that allows a decentralized, immutable, secure, and transparent ledger of records, right? And and this is the opportunity of lowering costs of managing and reconciling records, for example, reliably, of course, and then potentially also reducing cost of servicing various traditional practices. So many financial institutions are looking in Asia at these new emerging technologies cautiously uh, and keeping it an arm's length, uh, which is not surprising, but a few like the examples, which even Luis mentioned, SCB, um, they are, uh, they, they are incubating innovative use cases and starting to put it as a major area of focus in their technology and innovation roadmap. I think we're still in early stages of this transformation, but I think there's some compelling opportunities to apply these tech developments. And some of the examples in Asia that we are really seeing and which really come to shine in Asia is, for example, um, something that I think Dr. Michael really highlighted in his presentation, which is, the opportunity to serve the underserved and the underbanked. Here in Asia, more than any other region perhaps, there is still a large percentage of potential target customers, whether it's on an SME side or a consumer side, that are still underserved and underbanked. Now, when you start using technologies like 5G with opening up opportunities for remote ATMs, remote POS systems, digital payments becoming a norm, cashless payments becoming uh, possible from farm to market, if you'd like, these really start to open up opportunities of serving the underserved. And I think the opportunity of 5G uh, as the network gets rolled out across nations uh, starts really coming to life. With blockchain, I think uh, the example that Luis mentioned on deep tier supply chain finance, digital onboarding or eKYC verifications, 
start becoming really, really important and come into shine over here. Also, the new products that I actually mentioned previously on digital assets or sustainable investments and lending, I think they are really ripe in Asia for the taking. Singapore, for example, is a hub for digital assets and is well known for that, uh, closely followed with Hong Kong as well. And I think um, blockchain technologies are the fundamental uh, architecture uh, for digital assets and basically participating in that. So I think they're definitely important areas. I think edge processing is another area where um, we've, we're going to start seeing technologies like 5G and, 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 and blockchain really coming to life um, with ultra high speed transaction and payment processing. And I think something maybe a little bit further out, but starting to see some traction, especially in the post COVID world, is the opportunity for using technologies like AR and VR for remote client service or virtual tellers, which again will require a much uh, faster broadband and larger data packets to be transferred over networks like 5G mm. uh, in order for that to happen. So, I mean, these are just some of my views in terms of where I think that there is a lot of promise and opportunity in Asia for the adoption of such technologies like 5G and blockchain over the coming three to five years. Unfortunately, we almost ran out of time. I'm afraid they will, they will, they will take away my German passport for, for not leaving enough time for Q&A. But let's, let's just uh, uh, quickly check the, the Q&A box. There's, there's one question uh, for Michael Araneta. Uh, you mentioned how the choice of the partners is a key factor for success. How can the banking industry be assured that the fintechs, cloud providers uh, adhere to acceptable standards, Michael? Well, the well speaking of standards, I think many of the standards that we need for everything in open banking or collaboration or even cloud have already been set across industry, but also uh, in terms of uh, the use of these technologies, uh, they also have been defined on the, at the industry level. Uh, so the standards are pretty much robust and can be used readily by institutions. What we would like to encourage, however, is that the bank still maintains some form of governance around how these standards are used used and whether the partners that we are inviting to participate in our growing ecosystem adhere to those standards. So it's just your typical uh, governance mechanism to ensure the standards. You don't have to define the standards for yourself so much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and a quick question to, to Ruch in this. Um, I mean, what you described um, in your presentation sounds fascinating, but will it be a, will it be a dream for customers and a, and a nightmare for bankers? Will we all be replaced by robots and AI machines? That's an interesting question, uh, Oliver. Uh, I think the short answer is no, uh, we will not all be replaced. Uh, the bankers will certainly not be replaced by, by robots, but will there be more and more need for robots or robotic process automation, AI, uh, advanced technologies, absolutely yes. Uh, will there be a need for different skills? Well, there's a huge war of talent out there in the market. Uh, all the banks, you know, have to really figure out why should the best talent in terms of the advanced technologies join them? Because, you know, they have so many options out there in front of them. So how to make it an attractive value proposition? And finally, you know, the, the traditional bankers will still be required. They just need to upskill uh, and you know understand a little bit of technology because they are they are so important to make sure that the technology that's coming in you know uh, can be tailored and customized to solve real banking needs of our customers right mm -hmm. so 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 you so, so short answer is the kind of people that will require you know in terms of skills will be different but it'll still require people you know, banking is a very very you know people centric uh, business i don't think that will change uh, in the short term. Good. So there's still hope for people like me. <laughs> there is. Absolutely. Last question to, to Datuk Michael uh, Law. I mean, you, you have a, a lot of experience. I think you have worked uh, and, and collaborated with, with a lot of banks. Would you have an example for us of, of a bank in Asia who does the digital offer for SMEs especially well? 
Louis just mentioned that. Yes, right. Louis just gave a long discussion on the. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I think banks like uh, so we have banks like Alliance Bank in Malaysia. They have their Bismart, and then you have another bank. Um, uh, BCA also have the one that they work with a lot and they collaborated with a lot of fintech. Union Bank in Philippines, I think Michael Renata would have been talking to the CEO recently. They have also worked tremendously with a lot of fintech. So I, I think um, somehow you will see that in, in, in this region, there are some banks who are a little bit more progressive. They have started to do a lot of these things with partners now. Um, there are still a lot of banks today who are still wondering what happened, all right? Um, yeah, so there, there are so some of the names I've mentioned to you just very briefly. Um, DBS also has in working with certain uh, fintech partners and so on mm-hmm. and so forth. So yeah, tons of them. And uh, for those of you who are members of, uh, you are actually members of FMA, you can actually go to the FMA portal on fintechs. You will actually see a lot, a lot of these case studies on how they collaborated and so on. I do not see any more in the question box here. So I think, thank you very much.